Welcome to the Johns Hopkins Medicine online webinar series. Today, our breast imagers, Dr. Emily Ambinder and Dr. Eni Oliemi, will be speaking about a breast radiologist perspective, screening mammography and diagnostic imaging. Before we get started, we'd like to provide some user tips so that you're comfortable using this platform. The first 30 minutes of our program will include an informative presentation by our presenters, and the last 30 minutes will be dedicated to our live Q&A session. Please note this program is being recorded. To submit a question, please type your question into the Q&A box and click send. Your questions will be seen by others watching this presentation. So please note, if you do not want your name attached to your question, please check send anonymously. Also, your email address will not be shared with any third parties. We will do our best to answer all questions we receive during the Q&A session. Alternatively, you can email us questions and feedback to hopkinsseminars at jhmi.edu. At the end of the webinar, we would greatly appreciate receiving your feedback and ask that you complete our survey. A pop-up window will appear at the end of our program for you to complete the survey. And now I would like to welcome Dr. Emily Ambinder and Dr. Eni Oliemi to begin our presentation. Thank you so much for that introduction, Amy. We're very excited to be here. I'm Emily Ambinder. I'm the assistant chief of our breast imaging group at Johns Hopkins and the director of education. And I'm here with Dr. Oluemi, who is the co-director of quality and safety and the co-director of research for our group. So what do we do as Johns Hopkins breast imagers? So our, our whole group are experts in breast imaging. We all are subspecialized and only practiced breast imaging. And we're really lucky to be integrated with Johns Hopkins Medicine, which has world experts in medical oncology and surgical oncology. We're very proud to be part of Johns Hopkins Radiology, which was recently ranked as the number one radiology department by the US News and World Report. And this is our mission statement as a group. We aim to enhance patients' lives by collaborating and innovating as radiology experts to provide high quality, affordable, and efficient patient care. So today, we would like to follow the pathway of a breast imaging patient, talking about screening mammography and the diagnostic workup. We also would like to talk about the challenges that we've seen in the phase of COVID recovery and the safety measures that we're taking. So we're gonna have some polling questions during the talk. Um, we're gonna go ahead and launch the poll now. There are four questions. Um, we'll leave it open for about three minutes. So you can go ahead and answer the questions and we'll um, launch the answers a little bit later so we can just get an idea of who all is here participating in the talk. So the first question is um, whether you've ever had a screening mammogram before. So, as breast imagers, we believe screening mammography is very, very important. And we recommend starting having annual mammograms at age 40. And we've got good reason to have this recommendation. We know that when we find breast cancer early, when it's in an early stage, the five-year survival rate is 98%. When we wait and find breast cancer when it's advanced, when it's already spread to other parts of the body, the five-year survival is 27%. When we do screening mammograms, we're able to find breast cancers early when they're in this early stage and we have a very high chance of survival. We know that getting a mammogram can be, can be a scary experience and is not a comfortable one, but we have a really wonderful team at all of our sites at, at Johns Hopkins. Um, our, our techs are experts and they really try to make the experience as positive as possible. We, we take um, generally at least two images of each breast to allow us to see all of the breast tissue in two different planes so that we can localize any abnormality that we see. When you get a screening mammogram, about 90% of the time, you'll get a normal result. And that's, that's great news. So we, 
will tell you that the, the result is normal and we just need to see you back in a year for your next screening mammogram. About 10% of the time, the result is abnormal and we would recommend that you, get, you come back to get a diagnostic mammogram um, with or without an ultrasound also. But to reassure you, the majority of those cases that are called back don't turn out to be to be cancers. And we'll talk about this a little bit later, but um, it will be less than 10% of those that turn out to be, to be a cancer. How do you actually find out your results? If you have a normal result, those are released immediately to your MyChart and they're also mailed to you. If you have an abnormal result, we really wanna communicate that to the patients directly. So we have um, somebody from our team reach out to patients by phone to try to get in touch with you as soon as possible and try to schedule that appointment for you to come back in within the next couple of days. We also send the results by certified mail if we're unable to reach you by phone. Um, the next question was, have you ever had a, a digital breast tomosynthesis mammogram, also known as a 3D mammogram? Um, so, you know, we get a lot of questions about this um, relatively new technology, digital breast tomosynthesis. This was initially approved by the FDA in 2011, and since then has really dramatically increased in its utilization. We're currently using tomosynthesis for about 90% of our screening mammograms at Johns Hopkins. This is also called 3D mammography. You may have um, heard that term before also. We offer it at all of our sites, and it, we um, have found from uh, multiple research studies that this is really appropriate for all patients. And as, as breast imagers, we love digital breast tomosynthesis for, for two reasons. The, the most important reason is that we find more breast cancers, and specifically more invasive breast cancers. Um, there have been multiple um, multiple studies showing an increased cancer detection rate of up to 40% when we use digital breast tomosynthesis compared to the 2D mammography. So while, while as a breast imager, that's the most in, important thing, and probably for patients, it's also the most important thing. There's a, another benefit to digital breast tomosynthesis, and that's that we're less likely to call a screening mammogram abnormal. So our recall rate, which is how often we're asking patients to come back for additional imaging, decreases significantly. So studies have shown between 15 to 40% decrease recall rate when we use digital breast tomosynthesis as part of the screening mammogram. So we, um, we're very excited about this technology and are glad that this has um, uh, really been increasing a lot in the recent years. Um, I wanted just to talk briefly about how to schedule screening exams. We're excited that we have self-scheduling screening exams at, at Johns Hopkins through MyChart. If you, um, if you have a MyChart account, you log in and there is an option to schedule your own screening mammogram. So this is the page that pops up and you can pick which site you would like to be seen at and it will give you a choice of dates and times and you click on the time and you're um, be automatically scheduled. Um, if you would, would like to schedule an appointment and you, you don't have a MyChart, at the end of this talk, we'll have an opportunity for you to provide your name and contact information and somebody from our team can also help to get you set up with an appointment. Um, prior imaging is, is really critical when we're when we're reading mammograms, because what we're what we're looking for often is changes from one year to the uh, to the next year. We want to find very small early breast cancers, which will often appear as just very subtle changes on the mammogram. We try to make it as easy as possible to get those prior images from patients who are are new to the area or are switching to Johns Hopkins for their imaging. Um, so we will can help you through that process, and that is. Uh, um, at, at no cost to the patient. Um, 
just wanted to tell, also to talk briefly about uh, just some of the risk factors for breast, breast cancer, just to make, make everybody aware. Um, so unfortunately, most of the risk factors for breast cancer are things that we are unable to, to change. Um, these include uh, being female, uh, getting older, uh, genetic predispositions for breast cancer, such as the BRCA1 and 2 mutations, um, having early menarche or late menopause, having a family or personal history of either breast or ovarian cancer, having um, previous radiation treatment to the chest or breast. This is usually patients that had um, lymphoma as a, a teenager or as a young adult who had radiation treatment for that. And finally, dense breast tissue. So luckily, there are some ways that we can reduce our risk. Um, and I think it's really great for, for patients to, to know these. Um, so there are some things that we can do to de decrease the risk of breast cancer, and that's eating a healthy diet, exercising regularly, maintaining a healthy weight, uh, breastfeeding, avoiding smoking, and limiting alcohol consumption. So I mentioned dense breast before, and this is something uh, people patients often have questions about. Uh, I just wanted to, to just explain what it is that we're we're talking about when we when we tell a woman that she has dense breasts. So cancers can be harder to detect when breast tissue is dense. And that's because the when we say dense breast tissue, the dense part of the breast means the white part that we see on a mammogram. Unfortunately, most breast cancers are, all, are also white on a mammogram. So um, you can think about it like trying to look for a polar bear in the snow. Um, it can be hard to see because it blends in with that snow. If you move that polar bear to um, a different setting, into the water or into grass, all of a sudden that polar bear is much easier to see. And this is what it's what it can be like looking for a um, a cancer in a in a fatty breast compared to in a dense breast. In addition, we know that regardless of the fact that they're harder to see, dense breasts are also an independent risk factor for breast cancer. On your breast imaging report, it will um, inform you whether you have dense breast tissue and what should you do if, if you see that on your report. Well, we recommend that you talk to your doctor because you may benefit from supplemental screening, ultrasound, or MRI. Um, and that's something that would, uh, would be a conversation that you'd have with your doctor to decide. We also recommend supplemental screening MRI for patients that are at high risk for breast cancer. Um, and there's um, the three main groups that we talk about. These um, include women who have a genetic predisposition for breast cancer. Um, for example, those uh, the BRCA1 or 2 mutations. Women that have had chest radiation um, between ages 10 and 30. And like I mentioned before, this is um, usually people with a history of lymphoma who had um, radiation for that. And the most common group are women who have a 20% or greater lifetime risk of breast cancer based on risk assessment models. There are a few different models and they include multiple of the risk factors that I talked about earlier in this talk. So if you, you feel that you you have several of those risk factors, then um, it's, it would be recommended that you talk to your doctor and have a formal risk assessment done to see if you would qualify for a supplemental screening MRI based on a high risk of breast cancer. Um, I just wanna look at the answers to those two polling questions that I had. So the first one was, have you had a screening mammogram before? And um, very happy to see that that half the participants said that they have get one every year and a third um, reported that they do get one every year but they are behind this year um, and then we had some patients that were not 40 yet and um, about half of the participants said that they have had a mammogram with tomosynthesis and 42 percent um, have not and then there were eight percent that did not see what the difference is so hopefully 
my presentation talking about tomosynthesis was was helpful and I um, would definitely encourage um, encourage everyone to have their mammogram um, with tomosynthesis if it's an option at wherever you're going. I'm going to now pass the the presentation over to Dr. Oyuemi. Okay. Hello. As Dr. Ambaina said, I'm Dr. Oluyemi, and I'm happy to be here. I'm going to continue the presentation and talk about what happens when you come in for a diagnostic mammogram. Before I get into that, I just want to um, highlight for the 33% of people who said that they were behind on getting their mammogram this year, one of the things that I am proud of um, that our group has done is um, we've made it really easy for patients to schedule their mammograms, as my colleague said. Um, you can self-schedule it and you can come in. We're more than happy to have you come in and um, we'll even assist with requesting your prior mammograms if you've been going to a different facility in the past, because we'd be happy to have you come to Johns Hopkins. All right. So the next question is, have you ever had a diagnostic mammogram or ultrasound? And do we have the results? Okay. All right, so it looks like 50% of people have had a diagnostic mammogram or ultrasound before, 42% um, haven't, and 8% are not sure what that is. So I'm gonna address that in my next few slides. So we do diagnostic mammograms for several reasons. Um, these are some of the most common reasons why we do diagnostic mammograms or ultrasounds. Um, if a patient had a screening mammogram and there was an area that was seen, we ask the patient to come back for additional evaluation. And this is called this is called a callback um, because the patient is being called back from their screening mammogram for further evaluation. It is important to keep in mind that a lot of the patients who get called back from screening mammogram will end up being um, end up having a benign or a negative finding. Um, and so it's just important to keep that in mind. There will be a fraction of patients that end up needing a biopsy, but that does not represent the majority of patients. We also do diagnostic mammograms and ultrasounds on patients that have a breast symptom, such as a lump that they're feeling, um, an area of pain, nipple discharge, we also do diagnostic mammograms for patients who previously had a finding that was seen on a previous examination and were asked to come back for follow-up. Another group of patients um, in whom we would do a diagnostic mammogram is patients that have had breast cancer treatment um, within the past three years. So patients that have had a lumpectomy or mastectomy within the last three, um, past three years will, will be seen for diagnostic mammograms every year. Um, for the three years after their surgery. When you come in for a diagnostic mammogram, that we'll get mammographic images that may be the standard images that we get when you come for your annual mammogram and or maybe specialized images that we have in our toolbox to help us to characterize specific types of findings. So the specific images that we get would depend on the reason why you're there. Um, if, you know, we have images that help us to um, characterize calcifications that we see on the screening mammogram. We have different types of images. And so um, the reason for the visit would dictate what type of images we get when the patient comes. We may do an ultrasound examination also, depending on why the patient is there. Um, we often do ultrasound examinations when the patient is feeling a lump or if they have a specific area of pain. Um, it's important. One important difference between screening mammogram and a diagnostic mammogram is if you come in for a diagnostic visit, you will leave the appointment with your results and your recommendations. And if you are being um, told that you need a biopsy, then a doctor will speak with you to explain why that is. So when you come in for a diagnostic um, visit, you will speak to somebody. To, um, you, if you're having symptoms, we will ask you about those symptoms. We ask you to describe the symptoms, how long they've been going on for, because we want to make sure that we, we understand exactly what's going on. Depending on the reason for the visit, or we would often do an ultrasound examination, but not always. It just depends on the specific um, reason for the, the visit. And depending also on what the situation is, you, you you may get a chance to speak with a doctor during that visit. 
Um, if you're being told you need a biopsy, you definitely get a chance to speak with a doctor. If there's something that's concerning, we'll make sure we speak with you. Now, this flow chart here just depicts the pathways that the patients would have when they come to us for a diagnostic visit. About 70% of patients, the so majority of patients will have a normal or benign exam, and they will be asked to just go back to getting a regular screening mammogram in a year. About 15% of patients will, will have a finding, will be told that they have a finding that we that we think is most likely benign, but we want to keep an eye on them and have them come for follow-up in six months. And then about roughly 15% of patients will be told that they have a finding that needs a biopsy. And like I said, we'll make sure that we explain, we meet with them and explain um, why we're recommending a biopsy in th this situation. So I just want to shift gears and a little bit and talk about the COVID-19 pandemic and how that has impacted our workflow. So the final poll question that we have for the audience is, have you been to the breast imaging clinic since the COVID-19 pandemic began? So it sounds like only 17% of people have been to the clinic since the pandemic began. 58% um, of people have not needed to, and 25% of people are too hesitant to go. I'm hoping that by the end of this presentation, I can reach the 25% of people and reassure you that it is okay to come. If you have a need to come to us to the breast clinic, it is okay, we've taken precautions, which I will be describing in the next several slides. So here are some of the safety precautions. So we screen our staff members daily for any symptoms of COVID-19. We also screen all patients Patients are being screened over the phone and again at the entrance to the building. We are taking steps to carefully clean and sanitize all of our imaging rooms and equipment before and after the rooms and equipment are used by every patient. We use cleaning supplies that have been approved by the Johns Hopkins Hospital Epidemiology and Infection Control Board. Our goal is to ensure that every surface is properly disinfected. We've also implemented a new workflow that allows patients to wait in their vehicles until the exam room is ready for the immediate appointment. Because again, we're trying to decrease the amount of time spent in the clinic as much as we can. We've also redesigned all of our waiting rooms to promote physical distancing with adequate spacing and seats. We use seats that are made from special healthcare specific fabrics that are easy to clean. We Additionally, we've redesigned our clinic scheduling templates to try to space out the appointment times as much as we can. This is an example of one of our waiting rooms. This is um, the waiting room at the Green Spring Station location. And you can see that um, we have the seats spaced out, again, to try to promote um, physical distancing. Um, this hand sanitizer available in the waiting rooms. We also, when you um, are waiting to talk to somebody, we have footprints on the floor, try to encourage people to stay six feet apart, just as a reminder. So additionally, patients are able to use the self-screening tool um, to do this complete their screening before the appointments. And when they arrive at the appointments, they will have um, the mobile, the badge on their mobile device that they can display at our outpatient facilities. We've also, we also have um, COVID safety auditors that are rounding in all of our clinic sites. And these are staff members that have volunteered to do this for us. They're basically keeping everybody you know, on track and observing to make sure that we're all following proper hand, and hand hygiene, um, face mask, using face masks properly, physical distancing, um, Clean, following cleaning um, procedures. So all of this is just to keep our patients safe and our staff safe as well. Next, in, in, accord, in accordance with the state of Maryland guidelines, all patients and visitors at Johns Hopkins are required to wear a fisk, face mask with the exception of children who are under the age of three. Our clinic staff will also be wearing face masks and other types of protective equipments, including face shields. We've implemented new visitor guidelines to try to keep everybody safe. So for the safety of our patients and staff, new visitors are allowed to accompany patients to their imaging appointments unless it is necessary for medical reasons or for special needs or um, a child who is requiring imaging. 
for those people who who require care from a care de- caregiver because of a disability or for other reasons, um, they're allowed to have one visitor um, per patient. Any visitors who are not necessary for care will be asked to remain in the in, in their vehicles while um, their loved one is here for an appointment. With regards to walk-in appointments, um, we are not currently offering walk-in appointments at any of our Johns Hopkins medical imaging locations. And this is to allow us to properly screen all patients. And this includes um, no walk-ins for patients who are coming from an on-campus clinic. So I just want to wrap up my segment by, by with three takeaway points. So our group, um, Johns Hopkins Breast Imagers, our goal is to provide excellent patient care based on expertise and quality. And um, we take this goals very seriously. Our division is housed in a highly regarded department that's known for excellence in patient care, research and education. We've been working very hard to mitigate the impacts and challenges uh, related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Our goal is to keep our patients and our staff safe. And we look forward to seeing you in the imaging sites. All right, so I'm just gonna wrap up my segment. Thank you for your attention. Okay, let me see here. I think we're moving on to the Q&A segment now. Is that correct, Amy? Yes, that's correct. Okay. should see the first question in your chat box. Okay, so I see it now, thank you. All right, so the first question is, can the radiation from a mammogram harm me? So that is, uh, that's an important question. We, you, so when we do a mammogram, we try to minimize the radiation that we use to what is absolutely necessary to provide the medical care that the patient needs. Um, with everything that we do in medicine, it's all about balancing the risk and the and the benefits. And we believe that the benefit from getting a mammogram, which is the potential for catching cancer early and thereby saving a woman's life through early detection, outweighs the risk from the minimal radiation that the woman will be exposed to during the mammogram. You know, the which technology has allowed us to limit the radiation that a woman gets exposed to during a mammogram um, to a level that's comparable to what a woman might be exposed to to taking a cross-country flight, for example, um, which we will still do when it's necessary to take that flight, even though there is a risk for um, a little bit of radiation during that flight. And so we really just try to keep our radiation exposure to uh, for our patients to what is medically necessary to provide medical care that is essential. The, the second question is, how can I get a mammogram if I have a physical disability? Um, it's also a, a great question um, and something that our uh, mammography technologists are, are really wonderful at, at working with. Um, we, as I, I mentioned in, in my segment with a screening mammogram, we try to get um, two images of each breast to allow us to see all of the breast tissue. Um, and usually we have the, the patient standing up for these exams, but we understand that this um, the positioning can be difficult for some patients and our, our technologists can, can be flexible with um, with how they they can help position patients and can do um, imaging with a patient, for example, in a in a wheelchair if it's necessary. Sometimes the images are are not as as perfect as they would be if in a patient that can stand up. But we we do our best at seeing as most as much of the breast tissue as as we can um, in order to to try to find breast cancer. So definitely, you can still get a mammogram if you have a physical disability, and we would do our best to work with you to get as, as quality images as, um, as possible. 
So the third question is, do I need a referral to get a mammogram? And so I believe that you, a patient does not need a referral to get a mammogram. You can go and self-schedule like Dr. Ambaida described. The only thing is that we would typically want to know, have the information of the patient's um, medical provider so that we can know who to send the results to in addition to the patient. Now that's for screening mammograms. For a diagnostic mammogram, it is different. You do need an order to have a diagnostic mammogram. And this is based on, these are based on rules and regulations that are beyond our control. Um, for a diagnostic mammogram, you do need an order from your medical provider. Um, the next question says, uh, my mammogram report mentions breast density. What does that mean? So I, I touched on this in, um, in my part of the, the discussion, but breast density is a, a measure of how much of the breast tissue is made up of fibroglandular tissue versus fatty tissue. And having dense breasts can make it harder for radiologists to, to see breast cancers. And it, it's also an independent risk factor for having breast cancer. Um, if you do have dense breasts, then uh, you may benefit from supplemental screening with either um, breast ultrasound or breast MRI. And um, the, the recommendations on this are still kind of in the process. So the, what we are currently recommending is that you, you talk to your doctor about your own personal risk factors for, for breast cancer um, and how your breast density impacts that to determine whether um, you would be a patient who should be getting supplemental screening. Um, we still recommend mammogram for, for women regardless of your breast density. So the next question is, what if I am pregnant and found a lump? What are my options? So that's a great question. If you're pregnant and you have a lump, we will typically skip the mammogram because of the the, with the in, potential impact of the radiation that a mammogram involves on the fetus. And so for that reason, our standard protocol is to do an ultrasound, a breast ultrasound for pregnant patients who have a breast lump. And based on the results of that, of the ultrasound examination, we will issue recommendations to the patient of what to do as a next step based on what we see on the ultrasound. The next question is, are the 2D and 3D mammograms performed the same way with similar imaging equipment? So there is um, special equipment that allows us to do 3D mammograms. So not every mammogram machine has that capability. Um, at all of our imaging sites, all of the mammogram uh, machines that we have do allow us to do 3D mammograms. Um, so at, at the sites um, within Johns Hopkins, it's the same equipment that has the capability to do either 2D or 3D. Um, the radiation that you're exposed to with the two different um, techniques, the 2D versus 3D, is very similar. Okay, so the next question is, how would you evaluate a palpable breast lesion? So when a patient comes in, with a complaint of a palpable breast lump, we ask them questions, questions about when they started feeling the lump, how big the lump is, if, um, if it's something that they felt or their doctor felt, if, it's, if there's a lump that a patient is able to feel, then we would typically start with a mammogram as long as the patient is above the age of 30. So if they're 30 or above, we'll start with a mammogram. And at that point, the, the mammography technologist will ask the patient to point out the lump that they're feeling. If it's a lump that the patient is feeling and can point out, they will put a little marker at that location just to provide extra information to the radiologist so that when we're reading the mammogram, we can say, oh, that's exactly what the patient is feeling. So for example, the patient might have a benign finding that has been there for a while, but maybe they're just starting to feel it. Then that helps us to give the patient the reassurance that this is exactly what you're feeling. We see it on your mammogram, it's benign. You know? So they'll put a marker at the location where the patient is feeling something and it, right before they do the mammographic images. And then once we do the mammographic images, we will typically follow that with an ultrasound to further evaluate the area that the patient is feeling a lump at. Now this is standard, this is what we do as a standard, but of course there are 
other situations, for example, if a patient has had a mastectomy, that's they've had surgical removal of the breast due to cancer or because they have a genetic mutation, then we would typically start with ultrasound in that situation. If a patient is pregnant, like I said earlier, we'll start with ultrasound to evaluate the lump. If a patient is young, like under the age of 30, we will typically start with ultrasound as well. Um, so it all depends on the specific situation, but, but our standard protocol is to start with a mammogram and then do an ultrasound. Uh, the next question is, um, I have asymmetrical breasts, does that matter? Um, so asymmetrical breasts it's, are, are very common in, in, for women. Um, if that's what you've always been like, then it, it's nothing to worry about. Um, what, what we would like to know about is if you notice that there is a, a change in, in the shape or the feel of one of your, your breasts overall. Um, this is not a, a common presentation of uh, of breast cancer, but there are some uncommon types of, of breast cancer that can cause that. Um, so if you notice a, a change in an entire breast um, getting getting larger or feeling different, then that's something that we would we'd like to, to know about it and like to evaluate. Um, but if you've just always had breasts that that are um, asymmetrical, then that's that's nothing to worry about. It's just nor probably just um, normal for for you, and it's very common. So the next question is, I have Cowden syndrome, should I be getting additional scans? So that ties into a point about, that's a good question about um, high risk screening. Patients with Cowden syndrome or BRC1 mutation or any genetic syndromes, um, there are specific guidelines for patients depending on what their, the spe what, it, what specific um, genetic syndrome the patient might have. We have a great risk assessment program at Johns Hopkins. The Johns Hopkins cancer risk assessment program. And I would highly recommend that um, the person who asked this question or anybody else who's wondering about their family risk, um, maybe because they have multiple people, multiple relatives um, with um, who had breast cancer or um, other types of cancer, I would highly recommend the Johns Hopkins Breast Cancer Risk Assessment Program. And so they would be able to get you evaluated and make sure that you are getting the appropriate screening that you should get based on the guidelines for any specific syndromes that you might have. So that's what I would recommend. Um, the next question is, I am flat chested. Would you start with an ultrasound as well? Um, so the answer is that it, it doesn't matter how like large or small a patient's breasts are what we um, are more, what we are more looking at is how dense the breast is. So how much of, of the, the breast is, is that fibroglandular tissue versus fatty tissue. Um, and if, if you have um, breasts that are, are extremely dense, um, so have almost all fibroglandular tissue, then um, an ultrasound can be helpful uh, as a supplemental screening. We would still recommend doing a mammogram um, but it may be beneficial to do a screening ultrasound as well. Okay, so before, I just wanted to add with regards to being flat chested, we have excellent mammography technologists who are, who are very experienced and it, we have, you know, they are able to get mammograms on even the most challenging cases. And so if, if needed, they will get two people in there to help you get your mammogram. So don't be hesitant because you think you're flat chested or for whatever other reason, we'll do our very best to help you get your mammogram done. Okay, so for the next question, can an ultrasound detect breast cancer? Yes, an ultrasound can detect breast cancer. However, it is important to keep in mind that mammography it is the only modality that has been clinically proven to reduce mortality from breast cancer. And so for that reason, even in, dense, even in patients with dense breast tissue, I would not recommend trying to use an ultrasound to replace a mammogram. An ultrasound can be used for patients who have dense breast tissue to supplement a mammogram. That means in addition to a mammogram, not to replace a mammogram. And so while an ultrasound can detect breast cancer, an ultrasound can sometimes miss things that we can see with a mammogram and is an, a mammogram is the only modality that has been clinically proven to reduce mortality from breast cancer. So it is important to get your mammogram every year once you're 40. And if you have dense breast tissue, you can talk to your doctor about supplementing a mammogram with an ultrasound, not to replace it. 
the next question is, can you request a 3D versus traditional mammogram or does insurance require a specific diagnosis? Um, so you can, when, um, when patients come for this for a screening mammogram, um, we offer 3D mammogram at all of our sites and we offer it to all, all patients. So you don't have to have a specific diagnosis. Um, currently, most insurances will cover a 3D mammogram. There is an extra charge for that. Um, for that. Um, but there are, I think, a few insurance plans that don't, but that's something that we, um, we could help you, you figure out whether or not you fall into one of those categories. But almost all of the, the insurance plans currently cover 3D mammograms for, um, for screening. So the next question is, if a man finds a lump in the breast tissue, how would the diagnostics be done? So our standard protocol is if a man who is an adult man, um, so not a child, um, comes to us with a complaint of a breast lump, we will start with a mammogram. Okay. Um, and the reason why we do this is because the most common cause of a man feeling a lump is a, a benign condition called gynecomastia. And we're able to see this condition very well with a mammogram. And so for that reason, we start with a mammogram and if needed, we would do an ultrasound as well. Um, the next question is, if MRI is better, why not have an MRI right away instead of a mammogram? Um, and I, you know, I think that's a, a really good question. You know, the, the use of MRI in, in breast imaging has increased a lot in the last decade. We're, we're still learning how to use it in our clinical workflow. But as um, Dr. Oluwami mentioned, the uh, mammogram is the only modality that we have clinical data supporting a decrease in mortality from breast cancer. There have been um, a few uh, clinical trials recently looking at um, MRI and breast cancer screening, both in combination or um, in, in some studies replacing mammogram, but those studies are, are small and we haven't yet shown that that's a, um, that is a, going to be a, a way that we're going to be able to replace mammograms with MRI. Um, I think it's possible that that's where we'll be going in the in the future. Um, another problem is just on a just on a large scale, MRI is is not. We don't have enough MRI machines, um, and it's a very expensive test to recommend for all patients. So, currently, we're using MRI in women that we know have a, a high risk for breast cancer, um, because we think those are the women that would benefit the most from it. Um, but I think it's it's a it's a really good question and. Um, and something that you know, I think a lot of breast imagers are working at answering. Um, the other thing I, I should say is that there are also there are some findings and some types of breast cancer that we see better on a mammogram than on MRI. And so we we would um, at at the current time we always want to still have a mammogram when women are getting an MRI to make sure we're not not missing those findings. So the next question is: Do you recommend self screening? My gynecologist does them annually, but should I also be doing self-screening? All right, so that's a common question that we get. Um, so yes, yeah, self-screening is good to do. It's a good thing to screen yourself for any breast lumps. Um, if you're gonna do it, the best way to do it is to do it consistently. And what I mean by that is pick a certain time. So this is for women, pick a certain time of your cycle every month and do it that same time of the cycle consistently. So that way you can be comfortable with what is normal for your breast tissue. And when, if you notice any changes from the normal, then you can bring that to the attention of your doctor. Um, if you do it more randomly like than that, then it could be really hard to compete, to figure out what's normal and also um, figure out what is abnormal if you do it during different times of your cycle. Now it's good that your doctor is doing it I am um, annually for you. For some patients, they get so anxious when they do um, do their breast um, self exams and they may not do it correctly. So the recommendation is that if you do decide to do it, make sure that you're doing it correctly. You can talk to your doctor to explain to you how to how to do your breast self exam so you're doing it correctly and make sure that you're doing it consistently, which is at the same time of the cycle every month. So that way you can truly detect when there's a difference. So it's a good thing to do if you're going to do it correctly and consistently. 
Um, the next question is, I have metastatic axillary adenopathy with no known primary. Should I still be getting mammograms? Um, so this is um, this is an uncommon situation, but um, it's, a, it's a great question. So this means that this um, this woman has a, a lymph node in the in the axillary area in the armpit area that was biopsied and was found to have cancer in it, and they don't know where the the cancer came from. So in that situation, we we do start with a with mammogram and ultrasound to to try to find a primary breast cancer because we know that the the first place that breast cancer likes to go to in the body is to the axillary regions. If we don't find, if we are not unable to to find a primary um, cancer in the in the breast on those modalities, then we this is an indication for a breast MRI, um, and it can be very helpful because if if um, if we can find a, a small cancer in the breast on the MRI, that patient would probably be able to be treated with a, a lumpectomy. Uh, if we are unable to find a, the primary, you know, we don't know where it is, but it's presumed to be a, a breast primary based on the, the results of the, the lymph node biopsy, then um, usually that patient would be treated with a mastectomy just to make sure they get rid of that the, the, that cancer in the breast is removed. Um, so this is a an this is um, an indication for a, a breast MRI is a um, metastatic lymph node in the um, axilla that's a presumed with a presumed breast primary when a, a mammogram and an ultrasound is negative, but a mammogram would be the first step in that situation. So the next question is: If a woman has had a mastectomy, is it possible to do a mammogram? And so I'm assuming you mean on the side of the mastectomy, because we can definitely still do a mammogram on the other side where there hasn't been a mastectomy. Um, so for the side of the mastectomy, whether or not we can do a mammogram will depend on the details of the surgery. If a patient has had, um, if they had a mastectomy that um, left a good amount of tissue behind, right behind the nipple, then we could still do a mammogram on that tissue. Um, usually if a patient has had a complete mastectomy, we typically won't do a screening mammogram because um, then that patient will just follow up with their doctor clinically for the side of the, where they had the total mastectomy. Um, if a patient for whatever reason had a lump um, on the side of the mastectomy and we needed to do imaging, we'd often start with ultrasound and um, depending on what we see on the ultrasound, we may decide to do specialized mammographic views on the side of the mastectomy. But again, this would depend on the specific situation. It would not be the standard protocol. And the next question is, why shouldn't I wear deodorant? Um, great question. I know, especially in, in the summer, pe patients uh, don't like that we rec we ask for you to do that. But um, it's, it's actually very important because a lot of deodorants have um, some type of like metallic um, elements in it that we can actually see on the mammogram. And it can make... Um, make it hard to see the tissue underneath the deodorant, or it can um, can kind of fake us out into thinking that there's something in the breast tissue when it's really just the deodorant on the skin. So when we, when we, a patient does wear, wear deodorant and we see it, we'll actually ask you to go to the, to the bathroom and, and wipe it off. And then we will re repeat the imaging without it to make sure that we can really see the, the tissue, the tissue well, and that we're not missing anything as a result of that um, deodorant. I think Dr. Oluwami may have um, frozen, so I'll just um, go to the next question is, how long should I continue to get a mammogram? I am 59. So um, that's a great question. So the uh, American College of Radiology doesn't have an, an end age of when we should stop doing breast cancer screening. As long as a patient has an expected survival of at least five years, we recommend continuing screening. Um, we know that breast cancer becomes, is more and more common as a, as a woman gets older. Um, so as long as you are, are, are healthy enough that you would pursue treatment for a breast cancer, we recommend continue, continuing screening. Hello, can you, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can okay. hear you now. Okay, sorry, I think my internet connection was a bit unstable. All right, so the next question is, I am very immune compromised and I'm hesitant to come in for a mammogram since it is 
close contact. Are there any options for me? I have no history of breast cancer. So I just want you to know that we empathize with you. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has been really challenging for everybody. And I can imagine being immunocompromised that that poses additional concerns and challenges for you. Um, we definitely want to accommodate you and see you for your mammogram. One of the concerns that a lot of um, breast images have uh, with regards to the pandemic are not only potential for lives lost due to the pandemic, but the potential for lives lost due to delayed cancer diagnosis as a result of the pandemic. And so basically we're concerned that the pandemic could hit the population in multiple ways due to indirect, including indirect effects due to delayed medical care, such as delayed cancer screening. And so we would want to, we want to accommodate our patients and encourage patients to come in we have Saturday appointments that are where the clinics are less crowded on Saturdays. You can seek out Saturday screening appointments. Um, there are some sites that do screen, that have screening appointments with evening hours. You could seek those out, and typically at those times, the clinics will be less crowded. And so, if there's any way that we could accommodate you and reassure you in coming in to get your mammogram, we would love to see you for your mammogram. Um. Does a 3D mammogram have more radiation? So um, it's a really great question. So uh, we've um, been working really hard on the, the 3D mammogram technology. And currently the, um, the 3D mammograms have a very similar radiation dose to a 2D mammogram. When we, when we started doing 3D mammograms, we would get a separate 2D mammogram for patients to, so that we would have both a 2D picture and a 3D picture. And as a result, the, the radiation was higher because it was two separate mammograms. Um, that was many years ago. So since that time, we've um, developed a, a technology where we're able to convert the 3D picture to a 2D picture. Um, and we've um, there's been many research studies on this, including uh, one by our, our group showing that that um, we call it a synthesized 2D picture is equivalent in allowing us to see the breast tissue as getting a separate 2D picture. So when we get a 3D mammogram at all of the, the Johns Hopkins site, we do not get a separate 2D mammogram. And as a result, the radiation um, risk to the patient is, is very similar to just getting a 2D mammogram. So the next question is, is there any research being done on improvements for breast cancer screening? My breast cancer was detected very late and resulted in progressed breast cancer. I'm sorry to hear that, you know, one of our goal, one of our most important goals as breast images is to find breast cancer and find it at an early stage. That's the, really the, the most important um, reason why we do what we're doing. And we're constantly, um, we have researchers constantly going on to try to improve the ways that we screen for breast cancer. Um, tumor synthesis, as my colleague said, um, is one of the most recent advancements in breast imaging. And one of the reasons why it's taken off so much and is so popular now, it's really helped us to increase our ability to detect breast cancer. And we're also exploring other ways to detect breast cancer at an earlier stage. And this is something that we're gonna keep on working at with it until we get to the point where all cancers, all women can have their cancers diagnosed at an early stage and no woman has to deal with a late stage diagnosis. And that, that is our mission. And so we're constantly doing research to help us to accomplish this. Um, I had a mammogram and had a bruise on my breast. The technician was unhappy about it. Could it have been mistaken for a breast lesion? Um, so I, what I'm, what I'm assuming happened. So when you showed up for, for um, your mammogram, they noticed that there was something on the, on the, the skin. And um, usually when a patient has a, or when you, you know, you have a bruise, that's what you're seeing on the, the skin. But sometimes there's also something deeper in the breast, like a, a hematoma is like a small collection of, of blood. And then what you're seeing on the skin is just that discoloration. Um, and when we do the mammogram, some, we, we may see that finding in the breast and be unsure if it's just related to the fact that you had a trauma, you hit the breast there, or if it's at something that's, that's in the breast um, and something that could be uh, uh, worrisome. If it's clearly in the, in the skin, um, we can often tell that on the 3D images, if you, have, if you had a 3D mammogram and, um, 
and if the technologist will will mark that area, so we are sometimes able to to clear it with just the screening mammogram. If there is a finding in the breast tissue itself, under where you have that that bruise, um, we may there you know there is a possibility that we would call you back because we're worried that there is something in the breast. I mean, there's a good chance it's just a bruise and just that little collection of blood under the skin. But what we we worry about is that there could be something else that was causing that that bruise and that finding in the breast. Um, so, you know, I, feel, I think if you know that you hit your breast there, I think you would feel reassured in that situation if you were called back from your mammogram. Um, but understand that, you know, from our point of view, we, we what we want to do is make sure that that is nothing, nothing to worry about. Um, and we may want to have you come back and just take a closer look at it um, and then possibly do a follow up and make sure that it completely resolves. All right, so I have the final question, which is, do you read ultrasound images as well, not just mammograms? And the answer is yes, we do. Um, we read ultrasound images we, um, in addition to mammograms. We read breast MRIs as well. Um, when you come in for an, a breast ultrasound, we will review every image that has been obtained by a sonographer. And in many cases, we will go into the room and scan the patient as well. Um, but re regardless of whether or not you physically see one of our breast imagers, please know that we're reviewing every single image that was obtained during your appointment. Um, now, if you had the, an ultrasound of a different area of your body that's not the breast, then we have other um, radiologists that are specifically um, trained to look at those images and, and they will be taking a look at your images if it's not a breast ultrasound. All right. Thank you for your attention. It was really great being here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much to, to um, Amy and Asmina for organizing this and to all of the participants and all of the, the really fantastic questions. Yes.